this first ever event. And I've got to say, I, I said I was going to be here without a script. We're calling this, Dr. Tracy, the research rally. It's kind of like TED Talks, but even more exciting because it's here in the Hale Gallery. We're all enjoying time together. There's food, there's even drink. And this is, as, as Senior Associate Dean Kate Tracy described, this is supposed to have a casual vibe. So I understand while people are speaking, we'll all wanna be paying attention, but feel free to get up and get food, drink, and um, enjoy my favorite format for science talks. I have a relatively short span of attention, perhaps. Seven minutes. Now for the speakers, I'm told it's going to be seven minutes. And we even have an alarm that goes off after seven minutes. So not to put pressure on anybody, but, but the whole idea is, and people may run over a little bit, the whole idea is you've got a punchline, you've got a short period of time to make the rest of us understand the excitement you have about the story you're telling. So it's not grand rounds. It's seven minutes to, to really have all the different people here who come from different areas, may not be a, an expert in your area, get to learn from you. So this is part of Research Celebration Week, rebranded, am I at seven minutes? And rebranded, reimagined, and it's thanks to Senior Associate Dean Kate Tracy, who's been here now four years, seven months and whatever days. Uh, I'm so grateful. I must confess that I would love to stay all night, but since every talk's gonna be seven minutes, we will finish before quarter of seven where I have to go out and, and greet uh, Vito and Bassiani and for dinner. So I'm gonna be slipping out. I hate to miss, and I'm really hoping since the, the person wrapping things up is gonna be Kate Tracy, um, but this is going to be uh, just, I think, an amazing evening. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here, to say hi, and now to sit back and listen to some wonderful talks about great science going on in and around the Lerner College of Medicine. So with that, here's Dean Kate Tracy. So, so next year, the dean will be doing one of the seven-minute talks because look how good he was just on the fly like that. He hit all the high points. He kept it on time. He was funny and witty and punchy and on his way. And that is the spirit of the research rally. Uh, nice job covering all the, the high points so I don't have to. Um, we are serious about the timer. We won't claw you off the stage if you spill over a little bit, but um, try to keep things moving. Um, I would be remiss if I did not, in addition to thanking Dean Page for that wonderful setup, thank my planning committee. So I had this wonderful planning committee for research celebration. Round of applause for Liz Dorman, Joanne McVeigh, Aaron Montgomery, and Chris Berger, my partners in crime. Um, tr tr truth be told, when we had our first planning committee meeting and I said, well, I'd kind of like it to be a week. And they were like, oh no. Um, and I was like, well, I'd like to try. And they were like, well, you can ask the Dean and see what he thinks. And bless his heart, he was right on board with me. He was like, yeah, let's give it a go. Um, so he was all on board with rebranding the celebration. And I'm very grateful for that. And I think it's been a brilliant week so far. We're at the halfway point. This is exciting to see all these faces here. And I can't wait to hear all the stories. Um, I also want to thank our medical communications team that I have deviled substantially through this process of preparation. And that's John Turner. Kaylee Keough, Angela Ferrante, and Ann Howard, who have all contributed meaningful things to the celebration week. So shout out to our medical communications team. And just because I adore them, Vicki Gilwee, who is an ongoing source of support from the Dean's office to me, and Sid Bergeron, who are also, they, they line up sometimes in the morning when I come in the door and they allow me to practice my leadership wave as I come through the mix. And that boosts me up every given day when they do that. So thank you all for being part of the fun and bucking me up and saying, it's going to be a great week, Kate. And it really has been a great week. So thanks to all of you. Um, this is our inaugural um, event of the research rally. So I also want to give a special shout out to every single presenter that signed up voluntarily or was selectively asked to serve. Um, 
we have a wonderful group of presenters and I'm really looking forward to hearing all of their stories. Uh, is Evelyn Thomas here? Evelyn Thomas is an M1 in the back. Hi, Evelyn Thomas. I met Evelyn Thomas a couple of weeks ago and we had a fantastic conversation with the provost during which the provost told her origin story about how she became an autism spectrum disorders researcher. And I put her on the spot and said, you know, we have this rally, it'd be great if you were there. And Evelyn said, if you come, I'll get M1s to come. And last week I ran into Evelyn by chance and I said, you know, I got the provost. So I'll be looking for some M1s. Do we have some M1s? Shout out to the M1s. Very nice, welcome the M1s. And with that, I'm going to transition to our first guest of honor and presenter. Patty Prelock is the provost and senior vice president at the University of Vermont. She's been a longtime friend of the Larner College of Medicine, formerly serving as the Dean of the College of Nursing and Health Sciences for 10 years. Provost Prelock is also a professor of communication sciences and disorders and professor of pediatrics in the College of Medicine. The provost is also a recognized expert in the nature and treatment of autism spectrum disorders and has been awarded more than $24 million in university, state, and federal funding as PI or COI to develop innovations in interdisciplinary training supporting children and youth with neurodevelopmental disabilities and their families, and oh, that's a long sentence, I'm sorry, <laughs> to facilitate training in speech language pathology and to support her intervention work with autism spectrum disorders. She has over 211 publications and 585 peer-reviewed and invited presentations and talks in the areas of autism and other neurodevelopmental disabilities, collaboration, interprofessional education, leadership, and language and learning disabilities. We are thrilled to welcome you as our kickoff speaker for our very first research rally. Please welcome Provost Patty Prelock, our first speaker. Okay, I'm at about seven minutes and 10 seconds. <laughs> no, no, I think it's eight minutes. All right, so about, this works. Don't start the thing yet. There. About 60 years ago, a little boy was born and his name was James. He had Down syndrome. I was about eight years old at the time and I was a sister. So James had all of the characteristics that you would expect of someone with Down syndrome, delays in talking and walking and toileting, but he did learn and he did talk. But what was fascinating for me is that many of the children that he went to school with, about 90% of them could not talk. And so, like any 14-year-old would do, I went to his principal of his school and I said, what do you have to do to actually um, work here? And he said, well, you have to get a special education degree. And I said, mm, I don't get it. How can you learn if you can't communicate? He said, let me introduce you to my nine speech language pathologists. I had no idea what a speech pathologist was. They were an impressive group. I marched in on Monday to my guidance counselor and said, what do I have to do to be a speech language pathologist? And she said, well, you do love science. You have a great science background. Here's what you need to do. And I had spent a lot of time in the genetics of Down syndrome. I had done a science fair for the state on the genetics of Down syndrome. And I also thought, no, I want to be a pediatrician. No, I think I want to be a child neurologist because I had navigated all the healthcare situations that my parents went through with James. And I said, you know, sometimes it was good and sometimes it was not so good so I could change it. But then I realized that I needed to create a way to give voice to those who didn't have a voice. And maybe as a speech pathologist, I could give voice to the individuals with disabilities, but also the professionals who are going to work with them. So I was on my trajectory. I said, I am going to allow anyone that I work with, they're going to talk. Well, during my training, I realized, you know what, that isn't always the case. And and that there might be sign language, augmentative devices, gestures. And I learned an important lesson that just because my agenda was what is most important is verbal communication, that may not be the goal or the option for many people. So that was a hard lesson to learn. 
But I also realized that I was intrigued by the way that the most challenging children for other people were ones that I fell in love with because they caused me to think about how language develops, how we think, how we understand people's differences. And so I found myself working with kids with autism and adults on the autistic spectrum and those who had dual diagnoses of Down syndrome and autism. And I said, okay, this is my path. Now, all of us know that um, autism is a neurobiological disorder that has, you know, genetic differences, brain differences, but how we really make the diagnosis is at the clinical level um, and what the behavior is that we see. So the research that I've been doing is really developed through a causal model. And I, we look at what does <clears throat> the child bring to the table? What is the biological piece? Um, what is the behavior that we see? And then what is that center in between, that part in between, which is where we do all our research is at the cognitive level. And there's a synergistic relationship between what a child brings and what they show. And I realized I can't make a change there as they're navigating a very complex social world if I don't understand what is their executive function like, how they're planning and, and problem solving, how their theory of mind is working, what their working memory is like, how they're attending to things. And this is all in the context of the environment. So what we've done, our research has really developed um, assessment tools from infant toddlers through adults, both clinically um, child-informed as well as parent-informed surveys and self-reports to look at an assessment of theory of mind and understanding others' perspectives, mental states, et cetera. And then how do we build on the strengths that an autistic individual has and create strategies where they can navigate a pretty social world that they're trying to figure out and make sense of it. So we've developed social stories, which are short stories that really um, make explicit the hidden curriculum of social engagement. We also developed comic strip conversations where autistic individuals can actually map out a situation where it didn't quite go the way they wanted it. And they wanted to understand what were what was the other person thinking? What was I thinking? How might I change my behavior? How might they change their behavior? And then we worked at the language and literacy level in narratives and helping them understand what it is about um, the internal states of characters and stories that will help you really understand the story as opposed to just stating the facts. So this has been a, a wonderful opportunity for us to really connect with them and, and realizing that it's not about changing their behavior, it's more about understanding the social engagement that we expect in our neurotypical world and how they can adjust and how we can adjust. So let me give you an example of what it's like for, before I show you that, let me give you an example of what it's like. Have you ever driven from the Larner College of Medicine to home and say, how the heck did I get here? And you don't even think about it because you're totally on automatic processing. Now I want you to think about driving from the Larner College of Medicine to your home in an ice storm. And what happens is you start getting this incredible anxiety and stress. You can't predict what the other person is doing. You have no control. You have no comfort. You cannot wait until you get to a comfortable place that you will have control over. Driving through an ice storm is what autistic individuals experience every day of their lives. And I think it's really important for us to understand that, that nothing is automatic for them. It's all controlled processing, and they have to re-engage. Every day is new. Every experience is new. How you explain it is new. So I'm going to give you an example where all of us showed a little bit of neurodiversity that was autistic-like. And that was during the COVID pandemic. If you think about what happened in March of 2020, we got lots of information, but the information was changing all the time. We couldn't predict what um, was going to happen next. We were anxious. We isolated ourselves. We actually lost focus and perspective. And we actually talked in a way that we normally would not talk to one another. We couldn't understand anybody else's perspective. We actually demonstrated a lot of um, social communication and social interaction challenges 
but we didn't have a neurobiological reason for doing that. So my message to you as researchers is follow your passion and recognize that if you're working with clinical um, populations, that maybe your goal is not so much to change behavior, but to understand what the behavior is and why it's occurring and how we can, at a cognitive level, navigate each other's differences. Thank you. What a fantastic first talk. Next up, Dr. Matt Caparizzo, who will be talking about working to relax, why helping the failing heart fill helps it contract. Matt? Okay. Um see if we can get things going. Okay, so my goal today is to convince you guys that helping the heart relax is actually gonna improve its performance, which is what the focus of my research is on. So I think everyone here is familiar with the idea of the job of a heart is to pump blood through the circulatory system, deliver oxygen and nutrients to your entire body. And your heart is a muscle. And the muscle cells that power your heart are these cardiomyocytes, which are these rod-shaped cells. You can see we can isolate these in a Petri dish, and what you'll see is that they'll beat, they'll contract and they'll relax, which mimics the heartbeat in the lab. And these are specialized cells in that you're basically born with the same number of cardiomyocytes that you have throughout your whole life, which means these cells are really programmed to live 100 years, which if they do that, they beat over 3 billion times. And so what's fascinating about these cells is we're all sitting here, hopefully at rest, our heart's pumping about five liters a minute, but a trained athlete during exercise can pump up to 35 liters a minute. This is a huge dynamic range, and it's these cells that are responsible for adapting to that stress. And so we're familiar with what happens to muscles when they have to work harder, i.e. are under stress. They grow, and that process is called hypertrophy here. And so a classic case of hypertrophy would be Arnold Schwarzenegger right here exhibiting hypertrophy, the skeletal muscle. So your heart is a muscle, it does the same thing. So as at the University of Pennsylvania, here's two pictures of hearts that we had for research of human hearts. You can see a normal sized human heart and at roughly the same scale, a hypertrophied human heart. Now I can't tell you just by looking at this, whether that's a diseased heart or whether that's from a, an athlete, right? And the reality of it is, is that you get the same sort of visual result from all these different types of stress. So whether it's exercise or whether it's hypertension where your heart has to pump against an increased pressure, an increased load, it leads to the same type of growth. And these cells that are doing this are expanding and growing. Because like I said, you have the same number of cells, which means for that heart to be four times bigger, those cells have to become four times larger. So that's a massive undertaking for these cells to be able to do this. And while I said I can't tell by looking at it, if I pick up this heart, I can tell which one is diseased or which one is an athlete's heart because the stiffness is different. So there's something about the molecules that are in there that are changing. And this is what we want to understand as researchers. So if you just look at the leading causes of death by risk factor in, in the world, the top three out of five are hypertension, obesity, and diabetes. And so not surprisingly, because we just listed that these are cardiovascular stresses, the number one cause of death in the world is cardiovascular disease. It outpaces cancer by about twofold. The same thing is true here in the United States. About one in four deaths is due to cardiovascular disease, but this really isn't the entire picture. If you look at just these risk factors, we're all adults, about half of us have hypertension. About a third of us are obese. So all of us are undergoing this pathological remodeling right here in this room, effectively. And so this is a big problem, and we want to understand what those molecular pathways are. So hypertension, obesity, and diabetes typically come together. And as clinicians, we know that this leads to a certain type of heart failure. And so that's this HEF-PEF, or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And like the name suggests, preserved ejection fraction, the contractile behavior of this heart's normal. What happens to these hearts is the muscle becomes stiff, and that impairs its ability to fill with blood and to relax. And so these stiff hearts pump less blood, not because they can't squeeze, but because they can't fill. And so we're very interested in my lab in understanding what is the molecular signature of this stiffening? How is this changing? And then can we reverse it? And so when we think about stiffness, what defines our shape, right? Cells have different shapes. Our shape is defined by our skeleton. 
So your cells have a, effectively a skeleton too. And the bones of your cells are called the cytoskeleton, this family of these filamentous proteins. So actin, which forms a thin filament of your muscle, is loaded in these cells, whether they're diseased or they're normal. So here's an example of, of that, right? And this has been studied pretty heavily. But you know, until we really started our research, people hadn't really looked at these other filaments as candidates for this. And so if we image the microtubules inside a cell, you could see these stiff tubes run longitudinally along the contractile axis of the cell. So the obvious question is, well, well what are these things doing when the cell has to short? I mean, shouldn't they be oriented in a different way? And so we can do this with advanced microscopy in the lab. So here's a video of those microtubules. And you could see, hopefully, when these cell contracts, things buckle like springs. So the idea here is that these are resisting the contraction of the heart. And we did just sort of a back of the envelope calculation based on how many are here and how stiff they are. And theoretically, this really should affect the contraction and relaxation of the heart. So then the next question we had was, well, what about in disease? And so we had the supply of human hearts at Penn. And if you look on, on the, the side over there, um, Failing human cardiomyocytes have this increase in the density of the microtubule network. So there's this two to three fold increase in these stiff tubes. These cells are stiffer and they have this increase of microtubules compared to non-failing heart cells. So the big question is, well, how does this affect function? And that's sort of the question that we're trying to answer here and how it's dependent on etiology of heart disease. And so in the lab, what we've developed are these thin sheets of myocardium. So we could use a biopsy sample for something like this. And the idea is that we have these things working in a way that mimics the contraction of the heart. And so now we can try different drugs on this and figure out what's going to happen with different patient populations. And so for the microtubule question, of course, we're gonna use this drug colchicine, which el eliminates the microtubules from the tissue. And amazingly, what we found was that when we depolymerize the microtubule network with colchicine, we see that the, the colchicine softens the failing heart tissue. And the effect that this has is this actually improves the performance of the tissue, and not by helping it contract, but by helping it relax faster and stretch out more. And so we're really excited about this. And the next steps should be to figure out what the pathways are, what different types of stress drive microtubule network or modeling, and how, and if we can reverse this. So, I mean, of course, this is a great place to be, and I couldn't do all this work without all these amazing colleagues. Um, and in specifically, this working to relax was coined by Emily Hancock, who is right here. Um, and this was actually at the CVRI um, dinner um, where I think it was a, um, I'm gonna forget the name of it, but where we had to do these elevator pitches. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. And uh, that's it. Next up, we have Dr. Philip Skid, Associate Professor of Ophthalmology, talking about versatile teaching model I from Vermont to Ghana and beyond. Phil? Thank you for the introduction. When I looked at the invitation for this talk, uh, one of the things that they asked for was to have it multi-sensory, including potentially tactile. So I have brought props. So I'm going to pop them on the table. As we go through. So I'm a clinician. Um, I spend all of my time in the clinic or um, occasionally on service. Um, I come from a long line of artists. There are no other scientists or medical specialists in my family. And so when I came up with a problem, I tried to look for a creative solution. This is uh, one of my brother's pieces of art, um, and we've incorporated it into our project. Um, but the problem that I came up with or that I, I was seeing is when I have, whether it's residents or medical students rotating through my clinic, it's kind of boring to them because they can't see the most important part of the exam that I'm doing, the most interesting part of the exam that I'm doing. And when we look at studies of the ability for emergency doctors to see the fundus with basic, I'm glad that happened and we'll get to that, um, with the basic tools, we find that there's inadequacy at every level. And in this country, we, it's not that big of a deal because we have access to ophthalmologists or 
technology that replaces the ability. We have cameras and other tech to look, but in countries that don't have access to that or just in the clinic, developing those skills was the, the problem that I, I wanted to address. And so I started to teach myself CAD and decided to build a 3D model that would be a teaching model. Now there are other models like this out there, but they're expensive and they're not readily available. I think if you ask the medical students here if they've seen a schematic eye or had access to it, the answer would be no. My goal was to make this very inexpensive, something that if it got broken or lost, I don't really care. Um, and the idea would be to hand one of these to the students as they're rotating through our clinic to allow them to be comfortable with it and develop these skills so that when they're sitting down with me, they can have at least a little bit more access to the what I consider the most wonderful part of the examination. And so that's what you see out there, that little gray model. And that gray model sat on my shelf for about three years until a wonderful medical student came by looking for a project. And usually the medical students are kind of, I need a project to boost my CV or get an intro to research. What can I do? And this one, I said, ah, it's kind of preliminary, but let's go. And so this is the model that I built and it was inspired by this medical student who came to work with me and we put it to the test in our clinic. Here's a picture if you don't get to see the one that's going around the room. The old one is the gray one. That was kind of my prototype and the newer one is what we've put into what we what we've utilized for our project. This is the whole gamut and Andrew Delorier, the medical student who's working with me, came up with the idea to adapt it for smartphones. If you, I'm a little old, but most of the med students nowadays are doing smart cards on their, on their phones. Everything's kind of a, a, a iPhone-based study program. And so we adapted it for that. Some basic techniques for looking at the back of the eye, more advanced techniques. This is one thing that we actually discovered along the way is that when the student is looking, this is the view on the right of what the student sees. As an observer, I can look at the back of this and direct the student as to where and how to adjust his focus and move the lens. We even were able to demonstrate that you can practice laser retinopexy. So when your retina gets detached, hopefully you get to see your retina doc before it comes fully off and they can hit it with a laser and, and kind of weld it back on. Andrew, in an afternoon, was capable not only of demonstrating the skills to save the retina from detaching with these um, concentric circles of, of laser, but also trademark, oh, <laughs> trademark our, our device. And so Andrew was doing a year away for research, and this project went with him to Ghana. In Ghana, he partnered with Peter Akana, who is a retina fellow pictured in green. And we introduced this to learners there and queried them as to how they felt this enhanced their studies. Universally, they loved it. Their only suggestion was that they wanted more of it and they wanted it available to them all the time. In addition to that, the overriding goal is to make this available to everyone. And so Peter borrowed a friend's 3D printer in Ghana with no experience. We sent the files over and he was able to produce the first version of it off continent. For anybody who's interested, um, there's a YouTube video out there if you wanna scan that. And if you're really ambitious, you can download the files for free and print them here in our maker lab at your local library and so forth. 
I'm hopeful that we will build on this project. Andrew, two weeks ago, presented at an international ophthalmology conference in Atlanta, our work, and it was well received. Our paper is currently out there and hopefully will get picked up. Um, and more importantly, we're hoping people will use this product to enhance their skills. Thank you very much. I believe in being fair. Another round of applause for Phil, because that's really cool stuff. Um, and because we're running just a tad ahead of schedule, I'm going to take this moment to say, I have the best job in the world because I get to work with people doing really amazing things every single day. And I'm getting to hear your stories right now. And a little public service announcement for the, those of you in the crowd that are not presenting. Next year, it could be you sharing your story at research rally number two. And without further ado, our next speaker will be Dr. Stacy Sigmund, professor of psychiatry, talking to us about her love, not my love, my love of behavioral pharmacology. Thank you, thank you. All right, thanks, Kate. So I'm gonna attempt something I've never done before, not use data, not share slides, um, but instead attempt to take this challenge that you um, held up to tell my research origin story, um, also known as why I love behavioral pharmacology. Okay, so um, I was a pre-med student in college um, and kind of dutifully checking off and taking all the re required courses um, until uh, the semester where I could not get into a section of organic chemistry that I needed. So I grabbed a class called behavioral pharmacology. And um, for the first several weeks of the semester, the um, professor reviewed like the history of behavioral pharmacology, how it's kind of a mashup of clinical pharmacology, psychiatry, psychology, um, biochemistry, behavioral medicine. And she started to dig into the different, some different examples of um, scientific questions um, that are at the center of behavioral pharmacology research, uh, as well as some of the different tools um, that are used to investigate the complex interactions between drugs, organisms, um, and environments. And so examples of those you know, were um, drug self-administration and drug discrimination paradigms. Um, concepts like pharmacokinetics and physiological tolerance um, and positive versus negative reinforcement, um, how you can actually shift a drug's dose effect curve to the left or to the right and what each of those directions means, um, and then how to screen novel pharmacological agents for their potential clinical effectiveness um, or abuse liability. And so I'm not sure what drew me to the, that class. Um, I, I'd never known anyone that used drugs or been impacted by drugs, but um, I was fascinated. And so for example, how you can inject a pigeon every day with morphine until it develops physiological tolerance, right? So that the same dose of the same drug um, on day one, which completely eradicated, you know, totally wiped out the responding, um, after a few days or weeks of repeated administration, um, ends up producing no effect whatsoever, right? So the pigeon is back to responding on a, a key light, um, pecking on it under a complex schedule of reinforcement to earn food, like before drugs were um, in the picture. Uh, and then on maybe day 21, you switch things up and you inject it with a totally different drug in an entirely different pharmacological class. So you kind of expect the same thing to happen on day one, the responding will be suppressed. And then over the successive days, the response rate will gradually increase and eventually return um, to baseline levels. But that didn't happen. So instead the pigeon kept responding like it did the day before. Um, and you know, it can't be physiological tolerance because you've used an entirely different drug class. So um, what we've got is behavioral cross tolerance. The organism has learned to respond in the presence of a rate disrupting drug. Um, and this can actually be as powerful as physiological tolerance. However, if this is true, uh, how can it also be the case that 
someone can inject heroin every day at the same time in the same context, um, maybe their bathroom. And over the days or weeks that follow, they develop physiological tolerance, but also a host of conditioned compensatory physiological responses, right? Such that, and all of these are in response to the environmental stimuli and cues um, in the room. Such that yesterday when you walked into the bathroom, that cascade of responses began even before he took the syringe out of his pocket. However, today, when he goes to use the same dose of the same drug, or maybe <clears throat> even like a lower dose of the, of the same drug, um, but in an entirely different context, then there's no such cascade of compensatory um, responses that occurs, and he overdoses and dies. And so then we have behavioral sensitization. So I was fascinated. I was hooked. And so I... Um, volunteered to work in the behavioral pharmacology lab there in UNC Chapel Hill and spent my days and weekends and um, holidays administering drugs to primates and pigeons and rats and a range of studies investigating different mechanisms underlying the pharmacological and the behavioral effects of, um, of drugs. Um, and then after those two years, I decided to move from preclinical to clinical um, behavioral pharmacology research. So instead of injecting pigeons with cocaine and examining the behavioral cross tolerance between that and morphine or L-methadone, uh, we were injecting adult human volunteers with opiate use disorder with a recently developed sustained release formulation of buprenorphine that um, goes in as a liquid under the skin in a subcutaneous injection, but then solidifies into a pod and releases and maintains a steady state blood level of bup for weeks and possibly months after that initial single administration. Um, and the idea, of course, is that if the patient has an agonist med on board all the time and steady levels, it'll prevent them from the withdrawal that will set them up for relapse, as well as to, um, it'll block the good effects of an opiate if they do have a slip. And that can prevent a single lapse from turning into a full-blown relapse. Um, and so every week that our uh, patients in this first in human study um, lived on the residential research unit at Johns Hopkins, we conducted weekly hydromorphone challenge sessions. And, um, you know, in order to really determine whether this single dose of depot bute could produce substantial blockade for the weeks after administration, um, it did, and sustained release um, buprenorphine products are um, approved for clinical use. Um, so overall, since injecting my first rat in 1993, which is 30 years from this year, um, my fascination with the scientific questions of behavioral pharmacology has persisted, um, but the world outside of um, our science labs in that time has changed dramatically. So um, for example, as is the case with so many poor rural um, working class um, towns throughout the South, uh, my hometown was decimated by the prescription opiate epidemic that um, that hit our country in the late 90s and the early 2000s, so much so that um, my brother, who was three years younger than myself, started losing friend after friend to fatal opioid overdoses. Um, and we actually, somewhere along maybe around 2010 or 2015, we actually sat down, he and I, to try and count the number of kids that, that either he or I had known um, that had died um, in with an opiate overdose. And I remember we reached about 30, but I'm sure we for, you know, forgot about some folks. Um, and so since that time with the changing landscape of the opiate epidemic, um, it's been the case that that experience has continued to inform and challenge and shape my interest in um, behavioral pharmacology. So in more recent years, I tend to sp you know, spend more time thinking about how we can be doing a better job at moving um, the life-saving medications that have been developed in our academic ivory towers to the people who need them most, um, as well as how we can get rid of the barriers that are preventing a lot of the most effective medications or treatments um, like sustained release buprenorphine um, to being used in the real world. Um, and also maybe what lessons we learned from the original prescription opiate epidemic that could help us to respond like more effectively or quickly to the current fentanyl epidemic that we're experiencing. 
Um, so overall, I feel really very lucky to have found um, a career that allows me to pursue really fascinating scientific questions. And at the same time, at least hopefully on a good day, translate to some real world benefits to the people who are um, struggling with the very drugs that we've studied. And so that's why I love behavioral pharmacology. Another round of applause for Dr. Stacy Sigmund. You know, I just like to have a little bit of fun with all this, right? Next up, Dr. Gary Ahn, Professor of Surgery, Beyond the Hype of Medical Digital Twins, Getting from the Bunny Slope to Paradise. Gary? Well, thanks for the opportunity to speak to you all. I'm going to tell you a story. Um, this title is symptomatic of my research career because I am not a skier. I had no idea what paradise was. I was just pandering to a Vermont crowd. I had to Google what the most difficult run in uh, Vermont was, and paradise came up. So that's why it's there. And that's all I'm going to say about the title. All right. So my origin story started about 25 years ago at Cook County Hospital when I was standing at the foot of a bed of a young man who had been shot in the leg, femoral artery, bled out, pH of 6.8, sewed it up, gave him his blood back, and he's in multi-system organ failure, right? Total body ischemia reperfusion, abnormal systemic inflammation. And I'm standing there and I'm like, we should be able to fix this, right? We know cytokines get activated. We know that, you know, endothelium gets activated. We should have a drug that fixes. And it just about turns out that that was when the first anti-cytokine trials came out and they failed, right? And there was this rending of teeth, of gnashing of hair or whatever that acronym actually is, right? That malprop that I just gave you. And, and, and there was this kind of existential crisis in, in biology about the translational dilemma about the difficulty in taking knowledge that is acquired by very good basic science research labs and somehow being able to effectively turn that into a therapeutic. I never done any research in my life. I didn't know about anything. And to, to a certain degree, that ignorance helped me in my career because they didn't know what you couldn't do, right? But I think for anyone who's a trainee, that idea of wanting to have something to treat the patients that I take care of has driven me for the last quarter century to all sorts of things down this wiki rabbit hole, which is literally what I did because I Googled stuff. I went down Wikipedia. I'm like, that sounds interesting. That sounds interesting. Let me find an expert in that area and see whether or not that can apply to my particular problem, right? So there is a intellectual curiosity, right? That is advantageous if you're trying to solve a problem. The second thing is that, that you, you have to listen to these people. Right? You have to listen to them and try and understand what it is they're trying to communicate with you. And then, as a good scientist is, you're skeptical. Because if it sounds too good, it probably is. All right, Which gets me to this. So what is a digital twin? A digital twin is a term that is used in industry. It was originally described by NASA in the simulations that they used to run their um uh missions right they would simulate them and they would have a concurrent simulation in conjunction with a mission that they could project what might happen or what might not happen all right so this idea of a digital twin is very very pervasive in industry in terms of processing process engineering and in terms of um you know maintenance of devices and things like that and uh, the paradigm for this is in um, aircraft engines. So this was a workshop that I participated in on medical digital twins uh, back earlier this year. And this picture showing a real picture of, a, of an aircraft engine and a simulated aircraft engine is the paradigm, 
right, for digital twins because they have a real world device. They have a in silico specification of how that device actually works. And there's a data feed between the real world device and the in silico device. And they run simulations. They try and anticipate what might go wrong. When do you have to maintain this thing? What sort of things I would have to look for to try and fix it, et cetera. So there's a literal in silico simulation twin of a particular individual real world object. So obviously in medicine, that sounds really cool, right? I can make a in silico version of you and therefore I can use that particular in silico version to see whether or not you're gonna get sick, design drugs and optimize drugs for you and all that kind of stuff. Aha, if it sounds too good, it probably is. And we're not anywhere like this. So if you Google medical digital twins, they're like pages and pages and pages, millions of dollars have been spent on this particular technology. So there's a problem with that because there's a long way between these two things. And the first one is obvious, right? That engine, that uh, aircraft engine is an engineered object. They know how it works. There is a simulation that was used to design that particular object. In terms of biology, we don't know how it works. We operate in a sphere of perpetual epistemic uncertainty when we're dealing with biology, right? So the question is, if we want all the benefits of a digital twin, how do we deal with that? So my particular research is, is focused on creating high, res high resolution simulations of what you believe of hypotheses, because what we have in biology is, is hypotheses about how things actually function. And my particular research is essentially making movies of your knowledge, right? You take slide three in a regular cellular molecular biology talk, right? The first one's the title, the second one is the statement, and the third one is the diagram, right? The diagram is always there, and we make that diagram go, right? We create simulations that take that diagram and create whatever it is is represented there as a representation of what's actually happening. So we all love our hypotheses, but we have to believe that potentially and quite likely our hypotheses are wrong. So how do you deal with that? With my colleague, Jace Cockrell, who is a statistical physicist, he has brought a huge amount of information about how you think about uncertainties, how you deal with epistemic uncertainty and incompleteness. So there's this thing called the maximal entropy principle, which is intended to determine whether or not you can um, fully explain a set of data given a particular hypothesis structure. And we have advanced machine learning techniques that operate over that entire thing. And the idea of this particular methodology is to overcome the perpetual challenge against a model, which is what if, some, what if you left something out? What if you're wrong? So the idea is to use that particular technology to create populations of potential medical digital twins so that we can achieve this particular goal sometime in the future and be able to you know, do engineering on uh, human biology. Thank you very much. Give it up one more time for Gary on. Our next speaker is Dr. Liz Bonney, Professor of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Sciences. And Liz is going to talk to us about the importance of a good question. Liz? Well, good afternoon, everybody. I want to acknowledge the land we sit on or stand on right now is uh, belonging to the Wabanak tribe. I also want to acknowledge my ancestors of African and Aboriginal ascent and say Osio to you from the Cherokee tribe. Hush! One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Breathe, breathe, breathe deep, breathe deep some more. And I'm I'm the in I'm the resident on labor and delivery that day, and I see you know, 20 rooms of women and families in various stations of, of pregnancy. And I'm looking at the fetal heart rate monitor and I say, where's Dr. X? Where's Dr. Y? And 
is there another OR ready in case we have to do a stat C-section? Boy, this is going to be a long day because who knows what's going to happen and when are these tumors going to get rejected anyway? Hmm, that's an idea. Because I had learned about immunology, you know, I'd learned about the T cells and the B cells and the whole um, diversity of, of, of the uh, world of antigens that could be recognized by the, T, by the immune system. And I'd also heard that the mother doesn't reject the fetus during pregnancy. And I thought, well, until when? I mean, until birth? And what about preterm birth? And what about preeclampsia, this disease that kills mothers and babies? What's that all about? why isn't the fetus rejected by the maternal immune system anyway? And that became a question that was like an itch behind my ear or kind of a bad smell that you couldn't figure out where it was, gonna, where it was coming from. And, and so, you know, classical immunologists, I remember um, that, you know, they said that there was an impassable barrier between mother and baby, that the fetus couldn't be an antigen that could be presented to the maternal immune system and that the maternal immune system was suppressed anyway. So even if it didn't get exposed to the fetus, nothing would happen. And so after residency, I said, well, I need to try to go after this question. I need to answer this. So it led to data that documented that, yes, yeah, cells come across from the fetus into the mother and vice versa, that you know the mother's immune system could actually see and get rid of cells that were in her circulation, that, that you know, there are, are all kinds of animal models where you knock up this gene and knock up that gene and take away the, the uh, cytokines that are supposed to change suppressive, uh, change uh, T cells to be suppressive. You can knock all that stuff out and you still get uh, litters of mice that are 68 pups with half of them being male. And so the thing of it is, is that there's a couple possibilities for this process, right? You know, there are a million ways to potentially suppress the maternal immune system and they are evolutionarily dictated. Okay, I'm not going after a million possibilities. Thank you very much. That is not going to be my life in science. But so what I decided to do was to, to look at this issue of what was the basic fundamental theory that led to this idea that the maternal immune system should be suppressed. And that's self non self discrimination. Now, my mentor, Polly Madsinger, had come up with an alternative theory. So, self non self discrimination says that the immune system becomes activated when it sees non self, and therefore it has to be suppressed during pregnancy, otherwise, the salogenic fetus would be rejected. But Polly's idea, in distinction for that, was that the danger model, all that was needed for was for the immune system to become aware that something that was going on that was dangerous to the organism. And so therefore dysregulation, metabolic dysfunction, all of these things could happen and generate an immune response that would activate antigen presenting cells and drive you know, adaptive immunity. So, so instead of going after, okay, I'm gonna fight against the whole world of immunologists and self non self discrimination, or I'm gonna to try to hold up the danger model. I'm not doing any of that either. But I did wanna go after what could go wrong in pregnancy that could activate antigen presenting cells that could then make them become activated and generate an immune response. So that's where I went to do. So, um, when I came to the University of Vermont, uh, Steve Lucia, Steve Brown and Lucia Brown and I, and some of the reproductive endocrinology fellows, we were looking at models of pregnancy loss. And so the, the well-known animal model, the recurrent pregnancy loss due to immune dysfunction was also associated with methylation dysregulation. It was also associated with abnormal um, decidual artery remodeling. And you need decidual arteries to remodel to have a good placenta, right? And so uh, the other studies that we did was to look at various ways uh, that could go wrong in pregnancy. So senescence in the fetal membranes and inflammation from bacterial products like LPS and viral and viral infection. And with colleagues that some are here in the room, we're going to look at other ways to distress pregnancies. I see James in the back here uh, working on uh, stressful pregnancies that are 
uh, uh, associated with opioid addiction. Um, and we and Corey Tushers in the in the audience were looking at genetic variation and LPS induced preterm birth. And then we might look at other models. Um, it's like uh, those associated with social determinants of health. But this work on viral infections kind of changed the question, right? So, so if you give a mouse LCMV, which is a virus, and and you ask what is the immune response during that during that pregnancy, pregnant and non-pregnant animals make the same response, both in primary and secondary immune response to LCMV. But the catch is that even though the systemic immune system is totally fine, the placenta is infected. And the placenta and decidua is infected, and cells get to the placenta and the in the decidua. Um, and, and what about the baby? But the baby is totally free of virus. So you know, we literally took baby mice and put them in a blender, and then put them <laughs> put them on a plaque assay, and there's no virus there. And if we don't do anything to the babies and let them grow up fine and healthy, they have not an an ounce of tolerance against viral antigens, and they're not activated either. So as I'm finally saying, what's the story here? And in other words, what actually happens to the immune system during pregnancy? Well, fast forward, we worked on homeostatic proliferation, and that sort of scratched the itch a little bit. There's plenty of cytokines that are very important in the homeostatic proliferation and turnover of T cells. We've looked at autoimmune disease in pregnancy. We found some of those same mechanisms that are involved. And finally, we um, asked the question, or I asked the question, so really what does it mean for the pregnant woman to, or, or person to have to go through, through the changes in the immune system that are seen during pregnancy? And basically that's what we're working on now. We know that there's an interaction between T cells and the cardiovascular system. And we know that, for example, fetal cells that do get into the mother go into the mother's heart and cause microchimerism. And this may be the critical link between preterm birth and abnormal pregnancy or normal pregnancy and heart disease, which we're going to study later on. Finally, in 2020, there had been three things that happened. I mean, we were working on neonatal immunity, and but also George Floyd was murdered. And also COVID happened. And also the Burroughs Welcome Pregnancy Think Tank decided to make a big splash about its work on, on pregnancy-related disorders. 14 white men, three white women, one Asian woman from an, a predominantly white institution to look at a, a disease that was primarily of people of color. And so the question now becomes, well, who gets to answer these questions? Who gets to have the resources to be able to talk about the maternal immune system and other and other issues? So I just want to leave you, since the little dinghy has gone off, with this idea that I really hope that you all find a very fundamental biological question, but that you also are able to help other people to ask and answer theirs. Thank you. One more round of applause for Dr. Liz Bonney. Great talk. So right about now, my own anxiety is going up because there's one more and then there's me. So our next speaker is Dr. Gary Stein, professor and chair of biochemistry, professor of surgery. And Gary's going to be talking to us about the mechanistic and clinically informative breast cancer compromised epigenetic control. Gary? Okay, thank you. This is, I've learned a hell of a lot from this. I could 100% assure you. So what I'm gonna do is switch gears and I'm going to switch into cancer biology and molecular biology, but I could assure you that the exam is gonna be essay, so we're not gonna have problems at the end of it, that you could be 100% assured of. 
So what I'm going to talk about is uh, sort of where we are in a pathway to try to understand how uh, modifications in a phenomenon we defined as mitotic bookmarking is going to support epigenetic control. So that requires some definitions. What we're talking about is the non-DNA encoded regulatory information, which is critical for biological function. It is critical because it changes when you go from a normal cell to a transformed in tumor cell, and it's got to be sustained in order for a tumor cell to be able to survive. But one thing I learned, and I think everybody here is aware of, is the fact that collaboration is really the fabric of this institution, and it's these folks who are really responsible for work that I'll be talking about. So I'm going to, I've, what I've tried to do is encapsulate in four slides, how the onset and progression of cancer is mediated by not just um, mutations, DNA encoded information, but non-DNA encoded uh, information. That's important in terms of how the cell loses its phenotype, and we're gonna be talking about breast cells, how your mammary epithelial cell loses to specialized functions, and then how you initiate and uh, begin to see progression with cancer-compromised gene expression as the tumor develops, is sustained, and then it's going to go ahead to become metastatic. And for a cancer cell control, exquisite control is very, very critical for a simple reason. Um, cell division does not cure cancer. Cell division has to produce progeny cells that are going to be able to uh, support cancer progression. So, um, when we talk about uh, epigenetic control, you need to be able to identify an epigenetic regulator. We were able to do that several years ago. We were able to identify a protein, which is referred to as RUNX. It has a number of other names as well, but it's critical for the normal breast cell to be able to support its structural and functional properties when you eliminate it or when you modify it, you begin to see the deviation from normal to cancer and uh, net result is obviously very successful for the cell, but catastrophic catastrophic for uh, the patient. So how does this molecule, which we now call tumor suppressor, and there's a whole series of tumor suppressors that keep normal cell function ongoing, but how does it actually do its thing? And it does it in a very interesting way. Epigenetics is the non-DNA encoded information you are structurally and functionally modifying the genome. And here, if you just look at a typical gene, what you find is that if that protein is located at multiple sites in that gene. It scaffolds all of the biochemistry, the enzymology for modifying the histones, and is very key in order to be able to support plasticity, the remodeling of that genome, so that you can now suppress genes that you do not want to go ahead and to be suppressed. And you could activate genes that you'd not want to see being active. And that's a way of defining cancer progression in a biological manner. So what is the evidence that in fact, that protein that we're calling RUNX1 is actually a tumor suppressor? And it's very straightforward. If we take a normal mammary epithelial cell and we inhibit it, what you see in several days is a very striking change where you upregulate uh, a whole host of genes that are involved in what? Uncontrolled proliferation, cell mobility, cell motility. You've converted that cell into a cell which has really gone rogue. So I mentioned before that epigenetic control means that you have non-DNA encoded information that's going to be regulatory, but you need to be able to pass it on from the parental to the progeny cell with every uh, cell division that takes place. And that's strikingly illustrated here. This is a cell before cell division. All the green foci are that particular protein imaged in our imaging facility here. When the cell is undergoing division, you can see right here, the progeny cells are forming. There it is associated with the chromosomes. Those are blue. If you actually watch the cell going through cell division, you could see these mediators of epigenetic control on the chromosomes prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And what was particularly striking to us, and which was really the definitive evidence that you're looking at an epigenetic mediator, is that if you look at a metaphase chromosome, there you could actually see that tumor suppressor symmetrically located right on the sister chromatids. So the question we wanted to ask are, what are some of the 
most initial, the most immediate changes that take place when a cell is going to lose its normal properties, when you downregulate the, uh, the up to the rungs one tumor suppressor. So the experimental strategy was very straightforward. What we wanted to do was to eliminate the protein right before cell division, that's M, look at the cell as soon as it comes out of cell division, look at the two progeny cells, identify the changes in gene expression, and those would be immediate targets for diagnosis, prognosis, and novel parameters of um, therapy. So the technique that we developed is a uh, strategy that was uh, brought on board probably over the past three or four years, and it's called Degron technology. You take that Runx protein, you add to it a sequence which, when activated by a small molecule, is going to completely destroy the protein very rapidly, within 15 minutes. So you have the ability to be able to selectively destroy that protein and then look at the consequences in terms of the cell structure, function, and gene expression, and that provides you with information that is clinically informative in terms of understanding the status of the disease. And for the person who is going to be interested in drug discovery, it provides you with a series of new targets to be able to um, develop ways of either preventing or treating in a specific manner. If you go ahead and activate that Ronx1 Degron, what you can see is that you get a very striking change from a normal mammary epithelial cell to a cell which is very mesenchymal, very characteristic of the tumor cell. And then we ask the question, what is happening specifically with gene expression? So if you block, if you introduce that degron, if you degrade that tumor suppressor right before cell division, look at the genes that are expressed. 15 minutes later, when a cell completes division and you have two progeny cells, what you see is suppression of a number of the genes that are involved in breast cell structure and function, an activation of a series of genes that are characteristic of a cell which is on its way towards malignancy. And here you could see tumor promoters, you could see cancer stem cell markers coming up. So that's an approach that we feel is extremely promising. What we've done is really opened up probably more questions than we resolved, but it's a way that we can begin to address specificity and potentially eliminate off-target effects. So thank you. Another round of applause for Gary Stein. I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm a little bit like taken aback by how amazing all the talks were yeah, and how well. Oh. I did ask about this. To be fair, I did ask, could I be mic'd up with the Madonna mic and be near the stand mic at the same time without creating that feedback? Seems like maybe the answer is no. That's a, that's a working hypothesis. I'm just going to take it away. Now I'm stuck with the Madonna gong pipe. Anyway. I would just like to pause for a minute. We're running a little bit ahead of schedule, which is great. So I hope folks will linger afterwards. Did somebody plan the music to get me off the stage? I just started. Um, anyway, I'd like to give a big round of applause to everybody that's gone before me um, and was brave enough to be part of this um, talk series tonight. I think it's been a fantastic evening. The talks have been wonderful. I feel inspired and I love hearing about all the great work that is being done here in the college. So round of applause for everybody who stepped up. Talk quieter, talk louder. Just, just do me, right? Okay, perfect. I'm just gonna do me for now. So, so thank you for being here. I hope you're getting things to snack on. I hope you're getting festive beverages, which is, how we coded that. Uh, I hope that person coming in the back door is okay. Um, I'm here to talk to you and wrap it up this evening with the last talk. And my talk is about research, a pathway to the possible. So I grew up, sorry. I also cheated to figure out how I could create my own teleprompter. So I have my teleprompter right here simulator for tips and tricks. 
I grew up in a small town in Ohio. And by small town, I mean 1,500 people small, one traffic light that starts to blink at 11 o'clock at night because there's so little traffic. And I grew up a block and a half away from my grandmother. And we're going to come back to her in a little bit. It was a great place to grow up. Um, but for a bookish, secretly gay, tomboy kid, my eyes were always on what was out in the world, what was past the boundary of that small town. But my grandmother played a foundational role in how I started life, what I aspired to, and my belief that I could overcome what I thought were sort of long odds of coming up in, in a small town. Because I grew up a block and a half from her, I spent enormous amounts of time with her for the first 18 years of my life. And she planted the seeds of possibility in me. And through nature and nurture and divine grace of the universe, I became a researcher. And I have been fortunate to discover along the way what I truly believe to be true, and that is that research is the pathway to possibility and transcending long odds. Many of the challenges that we face today are global, they are complex, they lack simple solutions, and as a result can sort of feel nearly impossible to address or solve. The opioid epidemic, which Dr. Singh didn't make mention of, obesity, the global spread of infectious diseases that we've all been struggling with for about three on years now, access to good health care, climate change, poverty, global food insecurity, political polarization, migration and population displacement, and that's just a few of the problems. Our challenge is how do we make progress in face of so many complex global challenges when the odds seem overwhelmingly stacked against progress on solutions? I believe that research, and by extension, the tools and methods that we bring to bear as researchers are the pathway to what's possible and how we make progress on our biggest challenges. I believe that we are capable of making greater progress on some of our most intractable challenges if we continually ask ourselves, what is possible? Now, why do I believe in research as the pathway to the possible? I'm gonna come back to my grandmother. My grandmother was a fierce believer in possibility. And she was a matriarch in the best sense of the word. She worked a full-time job. She took care of her own house. She put a hot meal on the table every night. And she also raised three kids of her own, a whole bunch of grandkids, a bunch of great grandkids, and almost anybody else who came through her door needing a little bit of TLC because she believed almost anything was possible. She took care of so many souls and all with her lipstick still in place. And I don't have a very good lipstick game and she would be disappointed in that and an unending supply of patience, love, and cookies. Her door was always open, and she never ran out of time for the people in her life. She had time for lunches, for phone calls, coffee breaks, lunch out, or just a bit of time on the front porch swing. And that is what set the cornerstone of possibility in my life, was my time with Maxine. I spent enormous amounts of time just following her around, asking, can I, questions. Can I come visit? And if you look at, oh, if we go back up, the little dots, that's the one and a half blocks from me to my grandmother. Can I spend the night? Can I load the dishwasher? Can I make the chocolate chip cookies? Can I drive your car? Rather than tell four-year-old me that I was too young to make cookies, she stood me on a kitchen chair at the end of her galley kitchen. She measured out all the ingredients and handed each thing to me one by one to dump in the bowl. And she let me believe that I could make cookies and that it was possible for me to help at that tender age. A similar thread emerged early in my career development. I was a new assistant professor and I was asked by our director of Center for Vaccine Development if I would make a trip to Mali in West Africa and do some research capacity building. I don't know for sure that I even knew where Mali was at the time that he made the ask. And I certainly wasn't sure I knew what he meant by research capacity. But I said, I'll go and I'll figure out what's possible. So over two years, I made multiple trips back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, where I helped hire and train biostatisticians, data managers, data entry personnel, other types of research personnel. And we empowered the field site to actually be able to keep research operations in country rather than exporting it back to the US. And that was a really good and positive thing and something that I really am proud of. 
Now, while I was enjoying the capacity building, it wasn't really my first love. Women's health was my first love. And I wanted to know what the women's health needs were. So during one of those early trips, I asked my dear friend, Dr. Samba, so I said, hey, Samba, what do you think of me maybe doing some women's health research? And he said, well, anything that brings you to Molly Moore is a good thing. And then he said, let's see what's possible. So my research area was cervical cancer prevention. And at the time, Molly had no national screening. And the HPV vaccines had just been licensed. So they weren't yet available. And so I knew from talking to Molly and women that they were very concerned about women's health and cervical cancer. And they were desperate to have some kind of attention put on that topic. So I started the conversations and embarked on what would become my global health research agenda. Um, we started with colleagues and mentors and stakeholders who questioned whether the women would actually be willing to participate, whether they would share their stories, whether they would answer my intrusive questions about their health and physical and sexual histories. And they really wondered, given the small amount of money that I had at my disposal, whether I could answer any meaningful research questions. Now, from my discussions with the women, I knew they were interested. I knew they were supportive and just very eager to have access um, to research, to prevention, to screening, to anything that I was willing to bring to the table. And so I set about trying to figure out what was possible. We met with local physicians and identified collaborators, engaged their impressions of what was possible. We held community meetings with women to share our ideas and ask what they needed and to ask what was possible. Molly and women showed up in force, ready to be seen and heard, and they too encouraged me to step toward the possible with my research questions. So through these conversations with the local women and the stakeholders and the small amount of money I had on my career development board and the pilot grant I had, we launched a series of studies. And those studies were designed to better understand the epidemiology of HPV infection in Mali and women and how it differed from other geographic regions to identify the correlates of infection, especially those that might be unique to sub-Saharan women. And we also started to ask questions about, well, if the vaccine becomes available, how do you feel about it rolling out here? Ultimately, we parlayed those studies into a compelling application to the Gardasil Access Program that allowed us to provide HPV vaccination to nearly 11,000 girls immediately following a military coup. They don't teach you that in graduate school. So what's the take home message for me? 11,000 young women in Bamako, the oldest of whom are now young women in their 20s, are unlikely to ever develop cervical cancer or to die from it because we focused on what was possible. The idea of possibility is what set my feet, the feet of this small town kid on the path to becoming a successful researcher who wanted to know what was possible. Those same choices brought me here and made me your new Senior Associate Dean for Research, which is one of the most wonderful privilege of my professional life. So my closing message to you is this. In the words of Ted Lasso, believe. Believe that your research is always a pathway to the possible. That when the experiments falter and they seem too complex, too hard, too frustrating, take a deep breath. Ask yourself, what simple step forward can I take? If you're unable to answer the big question, ask yourself, what small question can I answer that would possibly add value to our understanding? The pursuit of the possible is the very essence of research. That is how we slowly make the world a better place through research and the magic of possibilities. My final message to you, get up each day and in your personal and professional lives, reach for the possible. And when you have the chance, share your research stories to inspire others to pursue the possible as well. Thank you for your time, your attention, your goodwill, your good humor. Please eat, drink, be merry, talk to each other, and thank you so much for making this event a success. There you go.